martial arts became an integral part of my life where, you know, rain or shine, there would be martial art training every week of the year at some point. Hey there, how's it going? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 568, with today's guest, Mr. Daniel Bolele. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. And if you want to know all the stuff that we're doing, because it's not a fixed list, it's changing all the time, go to whistlekick.com. Check out what we got there. If you've never been there, I think you might be surprised. You can even sign up for the newsletter where we tell you a lot of the stuff that we've got going on. One of the things that's going on is our store, and it's one of the ways that we pay for some of the expenses here with Martial Arts Radio. If you find something in the store that you like, use the code PODCAST15, it'll get you 15% off, and it lets us know that, you know what? That person who bought something likes the podcast. The show, it gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and the goal of the show is to connect and educate and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. That's why we bring you so many different people from so many different arts, different countries, different backgrounds, and yet we're all martial artists. That's the hook. That's what we do and why we do. If that means something to you, you want to help us out. you got a lot of ways. You could share the show, tell friends, follow us on social media, make a purchase, or support the Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. We give you a lot of stuff for free. And if you're willing to throw us a few bucks, we're going to give you even more stuff. It's all about value. We want to give you the most value we possibly can. So today's guest, as we were finishing up, once we stopped the recording, I, I told him, I said, I feel like we just recorded two different episodes. Today with Mr. Bolelli, we talk about two very distinct aspects of his training. We've got the philosophical side and the combative side, the ring side. And it was a really interesting conversation because not only are we talking about these two aspects of him and his training, but they weren't distinct from each other. They, they support each other. And it came through in a way that was different than similar conversations we've had before. So I really enjoyed it. And I hope that you do too. In fact, I'm, I'm sure you will. So here we go. Mr. Bellelli, welcome to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. You know, audience, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know up front, we had some, some interesting audio stuff, stuff that neither of us, I think, have seen from Zoom before. So hopefully we've got it worked out. Fingers crossed, right? Yep. This is, this is the beauty of technology. It, uh, it allows us to do so many things. And yet when it doesn't work, we, we've, we've built these foundations. We've built on these foundations of technology. And I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't know what to do when they fall apart. That's the truth. <laughs> Makes me makes me happy that martial arts is something that is so low tech, at least in, in the, the practice that we do. So we, you, you and I were talking, you know, we've got, we've got you living in, in California, we've mm-hmm. got an Italian name and I took a look at your pictures and it looks like we're talking about Chinese martial arts. So we, we've got quite a combination of things going on here. Yeah. So instead of trying to well, go ahead. Uh, yeah. I started out. I would still practice them, but eventually I started moving in different directions. I've, uh, for the last uh, 15, 20 years, I've been focused a bit more on combat sports. But um, so there's a whole range of things. What was the What was the origin? When When did you get started? I started when I was uh, how old was I? I think I was seventeen, and that was before I, I moved to US when I was eighteen. So I just got sort of dipped my feet in the water while I was still in Italy. And started with Chinese martial arts for probably the first, eh, give or take, about 10 years or so. And then, you know, I would still practice on Chinese martial arts, but I overall just kind of shifted more to our combat sports the following 20 years. And did you have any sort of interest before? 17 is an interesting age. We don't see a lot of people who start training in their late teens. Usually it's as a kid or as an adult. So what what prompted that? I think... um, I was always interested. It was um, I was both, I think, a bit intimidated, so it would take me a while to say, yes, let's pull the trigger in that direction. And also, by the time I made it to like late junior high, high school, I mean, I don't know, it was crazy because just Italian school is brutal in terms of requirement, that, you know, time requirement that it forces you to do how much you study and so on. So 
Combine that with that intimidation slash laziness, you really created a perfect excuse not to do stuff. Um, eventually, I kind of got tired of it. So by the time I was 17, I'm like, man, I keep saying I want to do this. I never do it. Uh, let's just go for it. And how did you choose the, the school that you started with? That was, you know, since we're talking about, uh, let's say I was born in 74. So that would have been 91 when I started. You know, we are talking pre-internet, pre-everything. So you're literally just looking at the yellow pages, seeing what's close by, you know, or if you find your luck, if you find a book vaguely describing the style and then you just run with it. I get it. I get it. And so that year that you had while you were living in Italy, was it the best thing you'd ever found? Was it something you just jumped into with both feet and didn't do anything else? No, I mean, it was... To be honest, like when I look back now, it was it was really fairly crappy training, but um, I didn't know any better, so it didn't matter to me. I just like the idea. I enjoy practicing because, again, I didn't have a frame of reference for anything better. So I was like, yeah, sure, why not? This is great. Um, eventually, I look at it back now and I was like, wow, that was fairly awful training. I think a lot of us have had at least some of that, maybe not you know, all of it from from one instructor, but you know, we look at some aspect of, of what we were given or maybe even just what we brought to it. I mean, I, I've certainly had some bad training sure. that was my own fault. But you said at 18, you, you moved to the U.S. Was that for school? Yes. I uh, I'd finished high school, moved to, to the United States for college. And then, um, and then you know, after that, I, start, I tried to pick martial arts back up, started looking around. It was, uh, you know, being in Los Angeles, there's pretty much every martial arts known to man a practice within a few blocks of anywhere you are. So that makes things a lot easier. And, um, and I had a blast. You know, initially I spent probably about three, four years, sort of, about three years exploring different styles, trying a little bit of this, little bit of that. Then I started getting settled for a few years in a much more focused frame on um, on a Southern Chinese style, um, commonly referred to as Kung Fu Sun Tzu. It's, um, it's, it's a style that this guy uh, named Jimmy Wu brought to the United States. More likely than not, is a variation on Choi Li Foot. There's a bit of disagreements on the history of the art, but that's what it seems like. Like that's the base where it started from and then moved into a bit of a different direction with it. When we get people on the show, it is mm -hmm. it is rare that a guest comes on and they are a casual participant sure. in the martial arts. You know, yeah. you, you don't find very many people who love martial arts and love talking about martial arts so much that they want to come on the show and talk about martial arts publicly. But here you are. So at some point, this became something that was, if not all-encompassing, at least deeply fundamental for who you are. Yeah. When did that happen? What was that like? I think around 21. When I started with Sun Tzu, I got a lot more serious. I found something that, um, that I enjoyed a lot more, that made more sense to me. And so from that point on is where martial arts became an integral part of my life where, you know, rain or shine, there would be martial art training every week of the year at some point. And so what was next, right? 17, you give it a shot. 18, you come here. 21, you start with this, this new system. And what did the next few years look like? Take us, take us down that, that, that novel. So I got, um, I got really heavy into it. I would, uh, as you mentioned, it would become kind of one of the priorities in my life. I was finishing college at the same time. Eventually, when I got decent enough at it, I started teaching. And um, that was nice because I, I was doing classes at UCLA. And then I ended up teaching some martial arts at UCLA. I ended up turning my weird academic direction. Once Once I got my master's, I got... I, I managed to kind of turn the academia and the martial arts, make them join together. So I ended up teaching some courses at UCLA about history and philosophy of martial arts, martial arts in cinema, the physical practice of martial arts. So I was having a blast. I was, um, you know, being able to make it a real part of my profession. Then eventually I started teaching more other stuff academically. I started focusing primarily on history. And the martial arts went back to being more of a private passion rather than something I did for a living. And also that coincided with a period where I, 
slowly phased, not exactly phased out, because I would still practice Chinese martial arts, but, you know, and I added others, you know, I started practicing Tai Chi, Bagua, Xingyi, things like that. But I also started focusing more on combat sports. So afterwards, it became uh, more boxing, jiu-jitsu, MMA, some wrestling, that kind of stuff. When we've had people on the show in the past, and they've made any kind of transition Mm -hmm. from one art to another, or especially in the case of what you're talking about, from what we might call a more traditional, maybe holistic perspective on training to a more focused combative oriented training regimen there's been some event there's been something either you know maybe they got in a fight or they trained with someone went to a seminar something so was there an event that caused that shift in your training no not really i was just um when, I mean, I loved training traditional martial arts. I really enjoyed it, and to some degree, I enjoy it still today. But there was something that was just kind of rubbing me the wrong way about seeing some of these guys who talk this humongous game at how great they were. And, you know, you could see these giant eagles being hiding behind the fact that they didn't really have to prove it. And I'm like, look, you talk so much crap about combat sports guys being a bunch of meatheads, and, you know, they're some reality to that. Of course, it's a stereotype, but there's a way to sometime it can get that way. But you're really not any better. If anything, your ego is even more giant because you are, at least these guys have to put their ego on the line and compete and either lose or win. And There's a basis of reality on this. A lot of you guys are hiding behind the veneer of spirituality slash uh, cool talk. When in reality, not only your skills suck, but also you have a bad attitude about it. Mm. So I wasn't, you know, when when I ran into enough of that stuff, I wasn't too fond of it. It became another thing. It became almost like talking politics or talking about something where people can say whatever they want and there's no reality check, where there's nothing, no objective standards that people are held to to actually stick to their claim. And so in that sense, I sort of appreciated the simplicity of combat sports where you you can talk all you want, but at the end of the day, you can either back it up or you can't. And uh, and I found that mentally relaxing. I found it less uh, these back and forth uh, arguments and things that people who get into. And it's like, no, there is no argument. You put it on the line and you either can rise up to it or you can't. And either way, it's fine. Then you take your reality check and figure out what you want to do with it. I found it really like, it's weird to say mentally relaxing, but that's really the feeling that I had from it. I get it. It makes sense. It's it's a much more, it's a much simpler way to look at training. If Mm -hmm. it benefits my combative skill, if it makes me more prepared for a confrontation on the street or something that occurs in a competition, a full contact competition, that makes sense. If the technique works, I should do it. If it doesn't, I shouldn't. Whereas traditional arts are broader than that, of course, and thus there's there's it's a, there's a much more complex set of reasons for why you might do something. You have a technique that maybe works or maybe doesn't, given the circumstances. Maybe you're not even doing it for combatives, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I get it. And that's where I think, to me. I get all that stuff. I'm fascinated with the martial arts, not purely for combat, because otherwise it's really get another hobby. Because in terms of realistic, unless you really live in a strange neighborhood or you have a horrendous life, the odds are you're not going to need it that many times in your life for real. So to me, of course, martial arts is about much more than combat. At the same time, I find that effectiveness is a good is a good ground to start from. And then uh, on top of it, all the other stuff, you can add it in any art you want. You know, it's the aptitude that you bring with you. You can have, I've seen, um, you know, maybe without philosophizing that much, but I've seen people who could turn the most Western and combat oriented, like something like boxing, they could turn it into a very spiritual practice and vice versa. I've seen people who could turn the most so-called spiritual arts in in just a vehicle for their egos. So to me, the other stuff boils down more to the attitude that you bring to training and to the training environment and who's in there. 
more than the art itself. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you 100%. We, we've talked on the show quite a bit about a lot of the things you're talking about, about, about ego, about the fact that it's about the instructor and the practitioner far more than, than the style. Yep. And the beauty to me of martial arts is, is you have so much room in there to find yourself. Yep, absolutely. As you started this transition, were you looking to particular instructors or guiding yourself? training partners how how did you facilitate that logistically i mean i i remember there was a phase where i was training with a guy named tim cartmel uh he had a strong background in chinese martial arts he had lived in taiwan for 11 years became uh, really like you look at his traditional arts and he was quite phenomenal at those but then he had also made the transition himself where he ended up becoming a black belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu he was training more with a combat sport oriented approach. And so seeing somebody whose skill and attitude I respected was doing exactly that, who see, didn't really see much of a contradiction between having a traditional background, but also being into combat sports, certainly facilitated that because it made it less like these two antithetical words clashing with one another and more something that you know, I could see somebody who had done that. I could see a, a path already traced there. It, it, it's funny. It, you know, one of my favorite things about the martial arts world is there are so many of us, and yet in some ways it is so small. And, you know, I, I you said Tim Cartmel, and I said, mm-hmm. that name is way too familiar. When yeah. was he on the show? Episode 354. Oh, that's funny. That's hilarious. <laughs> How did you connect with him? Uh, let me see. I was, um, oh, because he trained, uh, he was a master in the same style that I'd done, the Kung Fu Sun Tzu one. And then I'd read about him somewhere, probably, you know, back then, people would read inside Kung Fu or things like that. And I remember reading about what he had done, his journey, and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. He started with the stuff, and now he's teaching primarily Bagua, Shingi, Tai Chi. That's kind of cool. And so I went to interview him. I was writing articles for an Italian magazine for martial arts. And so that was often an excellent excuse to go meet people I was interested in, have a chat, see what I thought. And and I chat with him. I really liked him as a person. I watched his class. I really enjoyed the way he taught. And so I was like, you know what? I think I can add this to my practice. And so as you as you went through this, I keep calling it a transition, and maybe that's a little bit too formal to think of it. But was competition something on your mind? Did you step in the ring to test your skills? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I did. Um, I did a bunch of uh, smokers in MMA. I did a little bit of submission grappling. Um, I ended up even a couple of pro fights in MMA down the road. Oh. Um, so yeah, I did that for quite a while. It scared the living hell out of me. And I found it interesting precisely for that reason, because it was so scary. And so it kind of forced me to deal with, to deal with an environment where the stuff that normally makes me liked or appreciated by people didn't matter anything, you know, my, whatever intellectual thing I could bring to the table didn't mean a thing, uh, no sophisticated argument and anything. It was just about, can I perform under pressure or not? And I found that interesting. I found that, uh, again, terrifying to some degree, but also very interesting in terms of personal growth. Can you tell us about that first fight? I'm sure you remember oh, yeah, it like, vividly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a perfect example of whatever reservation I had about traditional arts. Because even though I trained some combat sports, you know, so much of my background was more in traditional arts. And it was funny. That's what I realized. Oh, man, so much of the stuff I've been shown, it really doesn't pan out the way they tell you. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a terrible fight. It was fairly close. Uh, I think I lost it by decision. But I was like, okay, that was a decent enough performance. But what I realized was that so much, like, for example, I started the match and I remember landing. Like, I did this technique exactly according to plan, exactly the way they show you, landing this two super heavy strikes. And, you know, according to everything I've been shown, the guy should have just quit right then and there. And I don't think it even slowed him down. Like he landed, you know, you could see his face torn from one side of another, and he just shook it off and walked forward. And I was like, oh, okay, that's a whole different game. Not quite what I was expecting. 
So that was a that was a pretty good wake up call. I have not stepped into the ring, and and uh, it is unlikely, incredibly unlikely. I, I rarely say never about anything, but I don't see myself doing that. But what you're talking mm-hmm. about, I've certainly seen from the seats, and and as I've watched on TV at times, the yeah. you can see the confidence when the aggressor makes contact when that when that good shot that good kick that good punch whatever it is lands and if the person sucking up that blow is able to shrug it off the demoralization that happens and i've seen that completely change a fight just one blow not doing as much damage as the attacker thought it would yeah psychologically is trippy because you're like you know you're dishing everything you can all the stuff that in theory should make a difference and it's not and you're like wait i'm in the wrong fight here what's happening and especially you know if you don't have enough if you have experience you know how to work around it but if you don't have enough experience it definitely leaves you in a state of shock or even i caught the guy in an armbar pretty fully extended armbar you know in training anybody would tap immediately on an armbar like that and, you know, because he was, he had maybe five millimeters left before his elbow would go, he didn't tap and he found a way to get out. And again, I was like, I am so unprepared mm. for this. <laughs> I just uh, didn't know how to deal with that degree of adrenaline and intensity. It's just not the kind of stuff that regular training uh, prepared me for. And here we have a great example. One of the things I love about martial arts is the opportunity to progress, that iterative progress. You go in. You try it, it doesn't work, and you know it doesn't really matter what the setting is. We have that opportunity. So mm-hmm. I, I'm really curious. You said you competed again. So what happened after this first fight? What did you change most as you went back to the drawing board, so to speak? You know, what changed in your training well, or et cetera? Yeah, I was mad again, not because uh, effectiveness in combat was the one and only value. I clearly, that's not why I practice martial arts, but I also felt that effectiveness in combat should be the base. That's like, we can add all the other stuff, and that's the important stuff to me in life. Combat effectiveness is overall a minor one, but I think it's a necessary prerequisite. It's like, if I don't have that, then I feel like I'm a poser. Like, all the other stuff is just me talking about things that... So I feel that that was the needed prerequisite before I can before the other stuff feels more real, feels like it has more meaning. So I went back and uh, realized, oh man, so much of my training really doesn't work in terms of combat effectiveness. And so I tried to switch things around. I started focusing primarily on grappling. Uh, Actually, that's not even true because I was doing a lot of boxing too. So I, I picked up boxing fairly seriously for about four or five years. And then I just focused a lot on grappling. And uh, and I think, you know, the grappling game in particular feels it's easier to train because you're not taking brain damage every step, every time you step into the ring and spar. I mean, striking arts are tricky because if you train too light, you don't know whether it's hard to have a gauge on how well you're doing because uh, sometimes there's always that, you know, you end the sparring session and you're like, huh, did that blow? Would have it stopped you if I really put the heat on? Would have... And so there's a lot more what if, whereas with grappling, you can go pretty full on and you have a very clear answer of where you stand uh, in the grappling game. So I did both, but I primarily focused on grappling and that translated to MMA immediately. Like my success rate in MMA went way up really fast, thanks to um, wrestling and jiu-jitsu. Wrestling in particular was interesting because I never even considered it, you know, it didn't appeal to me aesthetically. It didn't appeal to me on pretty much any level when I'd seen it, like Olympic Games, wrestling type of stuff. But then when I started practicing, I felt like it was probably the most useful thing I'd ever done in terms of um, combat effectiveness. I think for a lot of people who start with traditional arts and end up in some sort of you know, combination, MMA, whatever, whatever you want to label it, I, I think they're experiencing a lot of what I think you experienced. Here, here's what I'm I'm taking away. Wrestling didn't appeal to you as a standalone, but as part of a larger equation. It made yeah, sense. Absolutely. And you saw the appeal. Yeah. And 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 I see that too. And I, I 
I think we've all the majority of of our listeners are you know diehard traditional martial artists and just statistically they've probably trained in one or two arts right that's just i'm just playing the numbers and sure i'm sure this this was you as you were starting in chinese arts you get to a point in your in your sparring whatever Mm -hmm. whatever that that structure is where maybe you're 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 working with a friend and maybe you push that boundary a little bit because you know you've gone from striking sparring point style whatever and maybe you're tied up and you've got you're, you're holding each other and you, you kind of smile and say, oh, you know, if we had mats, you know, we could take this to yeah. the ground. Right. And, and I think it's we, we all recognize that there's some value there. And I think that's why so many people end up really enjoying this m- more fluid um, ability to transcend ranges, ranges of combat, yeah. kick, punch, wrestle, grapple, ground and just move it around because it gives you so many more options. Absolutely. And you have an instant, uh, again, you don't have to wonder, you know, so many guys in the arts I train with who talk this talk like, oh, by then I would have done this if you shot that double. But of course I can't do it because I would have to poke your eye in doing this, or I would have done this and that. And I'm like, how do you know? Have you ever done it on somebody for real who's not a drunk uh, on the street? Have you ever, have you ever really tested it when somebody's shooting a hundred miles an hour for your legs? I'm, how do you know if you can stop it or not? And then eventually I realized, A, they don't, B, they can't, you know, because, and, you know, out of politeness, then you stop testing it. But I've had enough of those tests with people who are so self-assured of their deadly skills. And, you know, a quick double leg would put them on their back with them, having no idea how they got there and no clue how to stop it. And I was like, ah, yike. Then it felt like, and again, I'm, it sounds like I'm coming down hard on traditional arts. I really appreciate traditional arts. I just finished yesterday. I was teaching to my daughter some Tai Chi form, and we are working Sun Tzu techniques. So I still practice them. I still teach them. I very much enjoy them. I just found that a lot of people tend to get lost in the lack of immediate realistic feedback and let that become... It becomes almost like a cult Mm. where you just tell stories to yourself and there's never a way to get a reality check. And again, not everybody's like this. There are plenty of people in traditional arts who are phenomenal human beings, who have a great attitude, who don't have a big ego, and who are even good fighters. But I'm just talking about in terms of law of numbers, the numbers of people who don't fit this more ideal pattern and who tend to fit more what I was describing is unfortunately fairly high. Sure. Sure. And, and I love the word that you used, feedback. Because again, that goes back to my model of, of iterative, iron sharpens iron, you know, personal uh, refinement of our technique and, and what we use. And, and I, I think that's a great way to look at it. If we think of it from the perspective of feedback, if, you, if you're never able to take what you train to such a level that you can find the gaps in it, Right. Then how do you really get better? And yeah, maybe you can poke somebody in the eye, but I'm I'm going to be honest. Mechanically, me poking someone in the eye, I know that's a pretty straightforward thing. I know how to make my fingers stick mm-hmm. out, and I know where an eyeball yeah. is. But I don't know that I want to trust my life to something I've never tried before. Yeah, and that's where I think is important to have both, because I think a more self-defense approach, more somewhat traditional in the type of training is great in terms of one side of combat. You know, it's giving you all the right targets, all the right techniques that you would want to use if your life is on the line. Uh, on the other hand, combat sport gives you all the wrong targets because you are, you know, you're not going for the most sensitive parts of the body because otherwise there would be no combat sport to kill each other in no time. Um, but you do develop all the right attributes in terms of speed, judging distance, uh, dealing with pressure, dealing with adrenaline, dealing with the resisting opponents, dealing. So to me, it's like both are important because you know I've seen. I've, okay, I've been fairly hard on the traditional side, but if you look at the combat sports side, I've seen plenty of people in combat sports having some delusions that their skill perfectly translate to the street in ways that they kind of do, but not as perfectly as they think. Like I've seen people where, 
you know, getting guy get into a fight with other guy. He shoots a double, take him down, get on top, start mounting him. Uh, he's ready to like. If he, this was the cage, he would be perfect. The guy would be dominating and is about to get a ground and pound win. And then the 120 pound girlfriend of the guy on the bottom walks up and she kick him in the face and knock him out. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> context is important <laughs> you know you thought you were fighting a one-on-one -on -one fight in a in a cage you're not you're in the street there's a whole other level that you're not considering and that's where the self-defense training come in giving you some of those tools so i'm not a guy who's arguing you know combat sports are eat traditional are bad or vice versa i think there are merits in both as long as you understand context and you find a good way to combine them and this is exactly where I started saying a diverse martial artist is a better martial artist. The mm -hmm. more things you learn, and, and that doesn't necessarily, though, often means learning different styles. It doesn't have to. It can just mean learning to apply what you've learned in different contexts. As you said, context yeah. is important. Absolutely. Most definitely. All right. So you mentioned your daughter teaching her some Tai Chi. Uh, I, I get the sense that you're no longer competing so tell Correct. us about your training now and how this progression has kind of um i mean we we learned how it shaped what you were doing uh i suspect that quite a bit of of that education led to what you're doing now and how you pre might present some things to others Yes, I'm, you know the bulk of my practice is uh judo and brazilian jiu-jitsu these days uh, with my daughter, I teach her Sun Tzu, and um, she's still 11, and I think it's, like, it's perfect to have a strong, especially for a girl, to have a strong self-defense base. Um, she likes Tai Chi, so I teach her that as well. And then, uh, you know, I'm slowly introducing her to some combat sports concept, but I think she has time. You know, she can jump into it later if she still like it in two, three, four years. And um, so that's kind of where I'm at practice-wise. Now, my girlfriend, she fights professionally in MMA. So, of course, I'm a little bit involved in that, in, you know, trying things and giving her some realistic sparring and doing whatever she needs to help her out. So that's kind of where I'm mm. at these days. I'd like to talk about that a little bit then with, with, with your girlfriend, because mm -hmm. that's... And, and not because it's your girlfriend, but because it's someone that you're working with. And I find yeah. that really interesting. You know, now, now we've got this interesting dynamic here where you start as a diehard, I guess we can say, traditional martial artist. You start mm -hmm. to have some, some of your uh, note, your understanding blown up a little bit. You go back, you try, refine, test it again, and step out with some level of competency and, and understanding of how things apply. How did she get involved in MMA and how have you guided her based on what you learned yourself? Sure. So she started out, um, she, we were talking about martial arts and she really enjoyed it, but she grew up in a really, really poor environment where there was definitely no money for lessons. So by that point, she wanted to, what is that? Oh, I remember that. Yeah, there was my former boxing teacher was always trying to help me out because I was going through a, you know, it'd been a really hard time in my life. My wife had died of a brain tumor. My I had a daughter who was only a year and a half year old at the time. So, you know, people I knew were really trying to be nice to me. And, you know, what can I do to help you? And in some cases, there was really not much. I mean, I appreciated the thoughts, but there really wasn't much that they could do. So my boxing teacher had asked me multiple times, hey, what can I do to help you? What can I do to help you? At one point I said, hey, um, the, my girlfriend wasn't my girlfriend yet at the time. And I just told my boxing teacher, hey, I have this friend of mine who's really interested in boxing, but she has no money. Would you mind, you know, can she train with you for a bit? And can, can you give her a pass and let her train? And he was like, yeah, yeah, absolutely, anything. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much. And she started training and she loved it. And she had a blast. and. She got really good really fast. She had a clear, you know, very athletic by nature. She had a good instinct by nature. And so she did that quite a bit. 
And eventually, because she enjoyed it, she's like, you know what? Um, I have another place where I was training. I was training at the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu club at the Cal State Long Beach University. And she's like, yeah, I'd like to try that too. I'm like, great. You can go there for free as well. Let's do it. And she, so she started adding jiu-jitsu. And, you know, she wasn't doing it with any goal inside. She was just having fun. But she was, um, you know, some people have a talent for it. And she started getting pretty good pretty fast. And so eventually, after a while that she was training, you know, we knew a bunch of people who had fought in local shows, kind of entry-level MMA. And so she's like, you know what? I would like to try it once in my life. And I'm like, sure, let's do that. And um, and she did, and the results were pretty, I don't know, <laughs> like spectacular slash scary. And, uh, and she had, any, like, I've never seen anything like that in terms of aptitude for this kind of stuff. And so after that, she's like, huh, maybe I can do it a little more seriously. I'm like, by all means, if that's what you want to do. And, you know, she picked up a second local match and then very quickly she ended up um, she signed with a major promotion she's uh, she fought in asia and uh, and all that wow. so it's been an interesting journey are you still coaching her i mean i i am and i'm not but i'm early i'm not because it's really bad for her relationship <laughs> i was wondering if you were going to speak to that that's always my the the, the thing that i wonder I, I i have a number of friends who you know, they're, they're married and they train together or teach together or one's a fighter. And that dynamic just looks so challenging. Yeah, it is because it, it's weird. It's like, even when we are old, it's like, if I do too well and I'm crushing her, she's going to get a little edgy. If I don't, then she feel like I'm walking through it. So it's a, such a weird life. So I'm much happier. She has a great coach who's a great guy who helps her a bunch. I'm like, Yes, let's do that. And then once in a while, we could have a conversation about, hey, what about this technique? What do you think? And, you know, keeping it more, much more hands off rather than having to be the one on whom she has to depend in that sense. I don't think. And it's funny because she's really easy to get along with in every possible way. But when it comes to training, I see she gets a little edgy when, uh, with me. Mm. She doesn't with other people, but with me, I can see she gets... I think it's an ego thing. Like She wants to look good in my eyes all the time. And so if she does anything that doesn't make her look good, then she gets annoyed with herself or gets annoyed with me. Or So I'm like, yeah, I think it's a lot better if we keep that part of your life a little bit separate. <laughs> do you... Do you sit ringside when she fights i've done it for the first couple of matches when they were here in us i did not when she fought in asia and um yeah it's not fun it's absolutely nerve-wracking i don't do well with it <laughs> um, so i, I think i would yeah, that's have the same challenge but I mean, it was trippy because I remember our first fight. That was the one that really freaked me out because, you know, you're there in this really weird situation where, you know, if you haven't been in there before, you're in the locker room and, uh, you know, the guy who's sitting next to you is going out to fight. He's coming back and he's all blooded up. And, and the guys are like, okay, you're next. Start getting ready. And, you know, it's so scary and intimidating. And she was like, you know, it's like if she was having breakfast at the at the table, would have had the same attitude, completely relaxed, zero nerves, zero pressure. And I was looking at her like an alien. Like, how do you not feel this pressure? How do you not feel I'm out of breath and I don't have to fight because I'm so tense? How in the world are you not tense? And she's like, yeah, oh, I don't feel good. I'm okay. I'm like. Okay, some people are really wired differently, I guess. And um, yeah. and then she went, and I was always a little worried because I mean I've seen her and she moved really well, and when she hit the bag, she hits really hard. But in sparring, she was always so delicate and gentle with her sparring partners. Even when they put a little heat, she wouldn't. And I'm like, hey, I know you have the power. Can you turn it on when during a fight? Because it's going to be kind of important. And she's like, yeah, yeah, don't worry. I, I can. I'm like, well, as long as you are convinced, let's see. And like, her, her match lasted 16 seconds and just knocked their opponent out cold with two punches. And that was like, 
oh, because <laughs> you know, especially in female MMA, you do not see that kind of knockout yeah. power with punches in particular. And so I was like, okay, <laughs> I guess I can just shut up and <laughs> make my concerns and shove them because you know what you're doing. So I'll be quiet. You mentioned that she had some aptitude for it, and what I'm what I'm thinking of, you know, I, I heard many years ago that if you're ever in the midst of a a group fight, you know, a, a bar, a bunch of people are in the middle of a brawl, the person who remains calm in that environment yep. is the one that is the most dangerous, the one you should avoid at all costs. And I'm thinking that yep. there's yep. there's a connection there that, you know, you're talking about her eating and just, you know, being completely relaxed and training and just, you know, just kind of kind of doing it and stepping into the ring and absolutely dominating. I mean, mental state is 90% of the game. It's like the first three matches she had, she was so relaxed. Like even like second match, she took a nap right before her fight. <laughs> the game, I'm just like, how could you? I don't even know how to begin to understand that. And then her fourth fight, which was a little harder, but not really that much harder from a technical standpoint. Something tweaked wrong with her psychology that week. She was edgy. She didn't know why. She... And in fact, she dramatically underperformed the comp- And I was like, wow, it's so trippy that you can basically tell how it's going to go before you even step in, just based on your mental state. I was like, that's, that's interesting. Did she lose that one? Yeah. And again, she lost a fight that, she, you know, she basically dominated for two minutes. And then made a horrendously stupid mistake, gave up her neck and got chucked out. And I was like, Wow, that is crazy because that's a match that you had in the bag, and uh, and just the mind wasn't your friend that day, and it usually is your friend, and who knows? And so you know, it, she needs to figure out why. You know, what are the shifts emotionally? What is that causes her to be so calm and relaxed one day, and then feel the human feeling that most people feel when they go into a match and instead and not do well with it and so that you know that's that psychological part of the game is the stuff that um, she needs to figure out she sounds like an exciting person to watch would you mind sharing her name we, we've got quite a few mma fans in the audience sure, sure. she's um savannah Riam. sometimes her name is spelled savannah like more americanized mm-hmm. like um but otherwise her name is in cambodia in savannah okay. if you type her last name em uh, she fights for one championship. She had a couple of fights with them. So she's, um, yeah, she had a couple of matches here at more entry level local MMA scene in California. And then uh, she fought twice for, for one. Okay. Let's go back to talking about you. You, you mm-hmm. seem like you have an easy time talking about her. We're we're going to, we're going to steer it back. Yeah. So we, we, we've talked about all the different aspects that, that make up, a, a fighter or a martial artist or however you want to look at it. So here's yeah. a here's a heavy question. If you had mm-hmm. to rank all the the assets that you have as a fighter, what would be your weakest? What would be the worst part of your fight game, as people call it? Well, I think my mind. I think I got way too nervous. Like uh, I have to be technically way superior to my opponent to do well, because um, you know some like. Somebody like her, she tends to overperform. She performs even better than she is in training. I tend to underperform. I get too edgy. Like I, by nature, I don't like conflict at all. I really bugs me, rubs me the wrong way. So it's harder for me than for the average person to get into a match. And how about the other end of that that spectrum? What what's the best part? I'm sneaky in the sense that I uh, I know I, because probably I've experienced so many different arts. I can I can always put in front of my opponent a look that they haven't seen. I can move in ways that are I can box, but I move different from a boxer. I can do some more traditional stuff, but I move different from them. I I can always kind of give a give a hard time to people who are much better than me just from the weirdness of the way I do things because it's not classic one thing, it's not an orthodox approach. So I've seen it, I mean, I even, I remember my boxing coach telling me, man, it's so weird, it's like every time you throw a great punch, you never hit me because I've seen that punch come 
10 million times from other people who are top-notch professionals. But every time you throw a really weird, ugly punch, you always hit me because I don't <laughs> see it coming. It comes from a really unusual angle. And, so, and I think that's one of the things that I do well is combining different styles and shifting from one gear to another well enough to keep somebody on their toes. Is that something that you developed intentionally or do you think that hack happened just by circumstance? I think it's both. I think it happened by circumstances because I was training in so many different things. And I think then I realized, oh, this thing works well. I'm going to make weirdness my thing. Because, you know, realistically, I was never the guy who could train seven days a week kind of thing. You, I had so much other stuff going on in my life that I was always training, you know, your three times a week type of stuff. So realistically, I'm not going to be able to compete with somebody who's putting in way more time unless I do things that these folks haven't seen. Or unless, like... For example, in terms of grappling, long before, like today, leg locks are a huge thing. Now, if you grapple, leg locks are going to be a huge part of the game. When I started, they weren't. And so I realized, huh, that's an interesting aspect of the game that most people don't touch. I'm going to get really good at that so that I can take somebody who is way better than me in other aspects of grappling, but I'm going to take it to their weak spot where I excel, and I may be able to beat somebody who is way better than me. All right. But ultimately, you know, some of the stuff, you know, we're talking a lot about effectiveness. And again, I think it's important as a base. But ultimately, if we're going to be real, effectiveness is interesting. I enjoy talking about it, but it's not it. Because it's like if, if all you train for in martial arts is to become a good fighter, I think you miss the boat. I think there's so much more interesting stuff in terms of personal development that comes from training martial arts where effective technique is certainly important, but it's not the be-all and all of it. To me, it really boils that. Like, I know so many people who are phenomenal fighters and terrible human beings, and I'm interested in how does gaining confidence through martial arts, how can that translate to you becoming a kinder, more decent human beings in your everyday interactions with people outside of the dojo? You bring up something that is is incredibly important to me, something that I have spoken about quite a bit. And instead of throwing my own thoughts at you, uh, especially since the audience has heard them time and again, I want to go back to that that idea that there are quite a few great fighters out there who are terrible huh. people. How oh, does yeah. that happen? I think is you know fighting is a skill doesn't mean you're learning to become a better person. You're just, uh, you know, what you... D- I think, unfortunately, I've said it a bunch of times about, you know, martial arts, to become a better human being, blah, blah, blah. The reality is that they don't make you a better human being. They give you confidence, and they give you a sense of... Uh, they make you more effective, more disciplined, and more confident. Now, these are great attributes in the hands of a decent human being. They are terrible attributes in the hands of an awful human being. You know, somebody who's not a nice person to begin with, who happened to be more disciplined, effective, and confident. I don't want a more disciplined and effective Adolf Hitler. You know what I mean? It's like, the fact that you became all those things, if it's at the service of a bad attitude toward life, it's not an advantage for everybody else. So I feel that they are, if you are a good human being, training martial arts will develop attributes that will make your goodness shine even more. But if you are not a good human being, uh, it's not necessarily the thing that turns your life around. Sometimes it does. Maybe you are a nice person, but you kind of had a rough upbringing and you just needed some discipline and confidence and, and your true nature would shine. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you are an awful person who now is just a very disciplined, awful person. (laughs) Great points. Absolutely. What about the future? What's coming for you and training and and any of the things that you've got in your sights as it relates to martial arts? I don't think he's... uh... I don't think it's going to change that much. I think I really enjoy training grappling. I really enjoy keep doing judo and jiu-jitsu. I would, um, I'm training some Shuai Jia, which is fairly similar to Judah in a lot of ways, but you know, it also has its tweaks on it. 
Um, I can see myself doing that forever as much as uh, my body holds. I would love to probably put a little more time into Tai Chi as a form of moving, maybe less as a martial arts and more for the meditative aspect of it. And, um, you know, teach my daughter whatever I can teach her. And, you know, maybe I'll, I'm, I was thinking since I now have a place to train in my garage with mats and everything, you know, maybe put out videos for people, not for any commercial goal, just something out there. People can pick up something useful from it. Great. And uh, I think the gig, you know, is like I'm more whatever my girlfriend is doing with it, I'll support it. Whatever my daughter wants to learn, if I can help her, I'll do. And then I'll just keep enjoying my practice. Nice. So, sounds like a, a open and yet satisfied perspective. Yeah. Nice. All right. If people want to get a hold of you, if they want to find you online, social media, email, websites, anything like that you can share with people? Sure. Um, I mean, always, I think, you know, the gods of Google tend to be good to us. So if, uh, <laughs> if you manage to spell my name correctly, which is Daniel with an E at the end, so D-A-N-I-E-L-E, -E, and then last name Bolelli, B-O-L-E-L-L-I, all sort of stuff start showing up. You know, I wrote four books, a couple of them about martial oh, arts. We, we didn't even talk about that. Tell uh, us about yeah. the books. Oh, yeah. So the first book I ever did was called On the Warrior's Path, and it was all kind of about philosophy and martial arts. It became actually fairly big. And um, and that's more about the beside the technical aspect. It's like, why do we train? What's the big deal about it? What can we get out of martial arts that translates to life? And um, so that's that was my first book. Then I did a couple of other books that had nothing to do with martial arts. And my last one was um, it's called Not Afraid. And it's a little more personal. It's a little more about it starts with martial arts, but then it also translates to you know hard parts of my life and how, in a sense, the way martial art training helped me deal with them. And um, so that's uh, that one is a little bit more of a biographical aspect, whereas the first one on the warrior's path is more philosophical in nature. All right, cool. And so that brings us to to the end. And in the end, we go out to the outro however you want to. So what what words, parting bits of wisdom, et cetera? You know, how do you want to close out our conversation today? I really think that sort of where I was going with the discipline, effectiveness, confidence, all that stuff, which needs to serve something greater. Now, of course, pretty much everyone in the martial arts think that they are the example of the good guy. Sadly, that's not reality. I think a good way to tell and a good goal to keep is to see how you relate to other human beings in day-to-day -day life. And precisely because you have gained something from martial arts, precisely because you have been empowered to some degree, you have gained a degree of strength, a degree of confidence, then your yardstick to see how well things are working is how you treat other people. If you manage to be... I, I'm always impressed and moved by kindness, particularly during hard times. Because, you know, everybody can be nice when everything is going good for them, but... When you're having, when things are really rough, if you can find a way to be kind to the people in your life, to the people you meet on the street, to to take whatever life is dishing at you and set it aside and not let the hurt be something that you pass on to somebody else, to be just something that you deal with because you have the strength to deal with, but then in the relation you have to other people, you really try to be the kindest human you can. I find that kindness is rarely a bad answer. So I tend to value it above most anything else. So like I said in the intro, we've got some really different stuff that we talked about today. We talked about these two aspects of Mr. Bolelli. And I think some people might think that they are in conflict. And yet, to hear him talk about it, I can't imagine a more unified, cohesive approach to training doesn't mean that it's what i want to do it doesn't mean it's what you should do but it's so clear it's what he was destined to do and i love that so thank you sir thanks for coming on the show appreciate your time 
If you want to find more, go to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. We've got some photos and links and videos and transcripts and newsletters. Sign up and, well, you name it. It's, it's a, well, maybe not everything, but there's a lot over there. So check it out. Check out WhistleKick.com. And if you're up for supporting us and the work we do, you can use the code PODCAST15 to get 15% off at WhistleKick.com. You can support the Patreon and share stuff and review stuff, buy stuff. You know, it's all good. We really appreciate the help that those of you give us. And those of you who don't, that's okay too. If you see somebody out there wearing something with whistle kick, say hello. Talk whistle kick, talk martial arts, make friends, help grow this community. And if you want to email me, it's jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 